a billion dollar sandbar dedicated to the proposition that all men should live like millionaires, if only for a couple of weeks. It's also quite a stage for high-flying girls. The most famous hotel of America's most popular resort. Miami Beach is to make people feel rich. And the Fontainebleau, or Fontainebleau as it's called here, is to send them away poor. For within a phantasmagoria more like a movie set than an hotel, you can just get by on 50 pounds a day if you're prepared to cut a few corners. This improbable palace, known as the Jewish Pentagon, tries to answer the ultimate American question. What do I do with my time and money? Now I've made it. It's entertained a who's who of guests, all the presidents, various kings, prime ministers, a scintillation of showbiz. James Bond was here, you remember, with Goldfinger. To its followers, the Fontainebleau's a fashion, a way of life, or maybe a way of pretending. For, on holiday, why use your own personality when there are so many more interesting personalities you can borrow? Why be satisfied with conventional surroundings when, for a few daily dollars, you can strut a stage like this. A certain ostentation, designed to make guests paying anything up to 200 pounds a day feel they're really spending twice that. Relentless air conditioning allows women, though in the tropics, to wear furs all the time. It's a Mozart Muzak minuet in swing time with a Gallic accent. The French motif only occasionally requires translation. Most of the 2,000 Let's Pretend guests who scramble for the 1,300 rooms of this pyramid of pleasure come from the New York rag trade. In this extreme corner of the United States, the kosher Nostra can swing loose and let go at the very end of their hunt for the fast buck. The Fontainebleau was created 17 years ago by Ben Novak, who arrived in Florida in 1940 almost broke. Now he's very rich, so when a newspaper says the Mafia control Miami Beach and have a piece of this hotel, Novak sues for $10 million. He's possessive about his Technicolor extravaganza with its Florida French accent. In his tanning yard, his cast of 2,000 comatose guests go through the color bar, turning in oil like French fries. They're here to show they've made it. Ben Novak certainly made it. He values his fun palace at 25 million pounds. I think we have that much in here today. The money that's been made, the uh, cash flow that has been made all these years, uh, uh, I think we have that much money in here. Now, how would you describe the style of the hotel? Well, it, it, uh, it's contemporary. I would say it's, it, it's far from modern, but she's uh, contemporary. We have a lot of antiques. I have over a million dollars in antiques in this hotel. So she's sort of a, a French contemporary uh, uh, design inside. The exterior, of course, uh, uh, I don't know what you want to call it. There it is. I've seen you describe it as the most beautiful hotel in the world. Well, yeah, I do, <laughs> because every mother loves their child. <laughs> and uh, I call it the eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> that's, that's, but, uh, that's typical Novak understatement, isn't that's it? That's <laughs> right. I, you can't blame me for saying it. We all have different ideas of beauty, and we all think our girl is the most beautiful. Well, in my business, I call this my girl. And I think she's different, and she's beautiful. Who, of all the celebrities you've had here, who, who are your favorite guests? Well, I guess we have almost had everybody here. We've had presidents from all countries of South America. We had your Prince Philip here. When he came in, I was so tied up that, that I couldn't get away, and my president of my company had to do, uh, had to do the, the uh, honors. I see. And, and it was something that, that I was looking forward to doing. Yes. So that's how tied up I am. I don't meet the celebrities, and I don't meet many of them. It, How about yeah. your least favorite guests? Who are, the, who are the guests you wouldn't want to see back again? 
Well, the ones that complain too much. <laughs> what are they complaining about? Who knows? Some people you can never please. Some people are just chronic complainers. It certainly would be my choice of a place to come on a, on a vacation. Um, you can't win most of us that are gathered here are, are uh, tied in with a, uh, a business convention. It's probably a, a nice tax deductible way to uh, catch a few rays of sun. Rather, rather gross, frankly. Large, overdone, rococo, baroque, call it what you want to. Uh, it's, 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 about, it's about as French as I am. Too ostentatious. I would stay here a minute after the meeting. Horrible. We're here for one reason only business. This isn't a place where you come and have fun. A lot of our guests wouldn't be happy unless they were unhappy. <laughs> and that, uh, I'm pleased to say, or sorry to say, as the case may be, uh, we managed to uh, help them out in this endeavor, uh, some sort of a masochistic enjoyment. James Baird, urbane assistant manager at whose desk the buck stops, though even at these prices the customer's not always right. No, definitely not. If I had, if a customer was always right, uh, I'd end up with, you know, uh, 3,000 Napoleons, you know, all having their own way, and uh, that in itself would create a little bit of a jam. So you frighten them first, do you? No, but we sort of point out to them gently that um, this is the way we do it. I do detect that a lot of them do moan and groan. Complaints generally are in very minor things. Like what? Well, tipping. That's probably our number one complaint. I must say they are rather offensive, the staff, actually. They do tend to take you by the throat, you know, and hold you against the wall and complain. <sighs> Actually, you're putting it mildly. Okay. <laughs> my, one answer might be to be nicer and to be more efficient. <laughs> I'm I'd, I'd much more likely to give a big I tip. I don't who's believe good. there's any real answer to it. I'll tell you, tipping is it's a blasted nuisance. And I'm using a mild word. It is just simply a nuisance. Everybody, it's like the weather. Everybody talks about it. Nobody knows what to do about it. And frankly, I don't know the answer to it either. As a permanent resident here, how would you describe the style of the place? indescribable. It's easy to say, well, this is vulgar, uh, this is outrageous, uh, this is a nouveau, this is Hollywood 1930, but it gives a certain feeling to people and strange enough they feel at home and they want to come back. So what do we offer them here? We offer them uh, marble and matzo ball soup. Uh, the people want to be uh, surrounded by luxury, but they also want all the comfortableness of home. They want a kind of family atmosphere, which, strange enough, we give them here. It doesn't look like it from here, really. Well, <laughs> yes, but when you, you get um, uh, all these large rooms and filled with mirrors and gold and marble, when it's filled with our clientele, it, uh, strange enough, becomes very warm and friendly. Most people would be very uncomfortable in the Palace of Versailles. You see? They mm -hmm. really would be. How do you set about pleasing the adults? What? Uh... How do you weave a spell over them to make sure they'll come back again? Well, you give them something to remember. And the bill. <laughs> no. <laughs> if I can, I'll get the payment out of them before they leave. The, um, you give them something to remember. A, uh, and strange enough, people remember something nice. They, they tend to forget uh, the... Uh, maybe some of the unpleasantness or a rude waiter or something like that. And an English reaction? Well, I find the people absolute characters. Each one unto himself is a character. The people really aren't for real. What's unreal about them? Just the entirety of them. Their, their clothes, their outlook. The fact that they quote everything in telephone numbers. Which is hard, even in the lift. It's all telephone numbers. How do you mean? Hundreds of thousands of dollars, and the condominium is going to cost me, oh, two hundred thousand dollars. Is it? Just not. You see, now everybody comes on like a millionaire, but I'm told that not everybody is. No, 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 no. And from what I've been told, people really come here to impress one another. They hire suitcases, and they come with a whole fleet of matched luggage so that they'll impress, even if some of them are empty. Yes. Uh, yes, really and truly. <laughs> of course, you can hire minks and uh, oh, yes, everything. furs and jewellery yeah. and that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Have you had a look at some of the women's pans down here? 
They have jewellery, diamond watches, even the men. Diamond and ruby watches, diamonds on their fingers, diamond bracelets. Now, do you think they're hired or do you think that's for real? I think most of it is for real, yes. Most of it. Now, what about the, pe what about the attraction of the people? Do you find that the women are, are attractive? No, and the men are much too fat. Yes, they're well, very preoccupied with their figures and their health, but they are much too fat. Even the young girls, I find, are not as attractive as they should be. Not like the girls in the south of France, or even on our beaches. The Fontainebleau's proudest possession is Miami's longest stretch of beach, 1,300 feet of private sand. But having bought it, nobody wants it. It's the only place where you can be alone, where 20-pound-a-day cabanas turn their backs upon the superfluous sea. This is the place to sit and stare. A broker's office within the hotel, where New York stock exchange prices pass in a reverential hush before holidaymakers pursuing a sort of happiness. Some people spend hours in here, don't they? It's, it's a funny sort of holiday. I can't tell you why. Put 50,000, 100,000, and you'll spend a lot of time there. I guess they have their sense of value. It's not much of a holiday, is it? They're having fun. But they come down here to buy all this expensive sun. And then you're sitting in here. Do <laughs> you think you're getting your money's worth? Not really. Never get your money worth down here. So am I getting paid for this thing? <laughs> you're, you're making money. Yeah. No, I'm losing money. <laughs> How much of the sun do you take here? You get cooked out here. It's not what you call getting away from it all holiday, is it? No. No, it isn't. What is the appeal of the, of the fountain blue? What's it got? I don't know really what it has, but it does get the action. And people just come just to watch the action, just like a show, just sitting in a, in a lobby watching <laughs> other people. A lot of people come here just to sit in the lobby and uh, sit and watch the other people come here. It's better than a Broadway show. Once a week, the Fontainebleau provides a free party for its guests. They may be paying a hundred pounds a day for their rooms, but food's not included. So a free meal is approached with zeal and determination. Behind locked doors, the goodies await, while the MC controls the defences. Keep them out and don't let anyone in unless they have a ticket or a cabana card. I don't care if they want well, Kanye. We're about to see the invasion. If you think the Christians in the, in the, the arena were bad, wait till you see what happens. Getting a thousand people in this room is like, it's like squeezing 20 pounds of meat in a two pound bag. Let him go, watch it. I notice the psychology. The yes. psychology is the food is free, yes. but the plates are very small, so they can't take too much. That's true, and we have it in a secluded area, so if some people don't hear about it, we have enough food to go around twice with the people who did hear about it. The other thing that surprises me is that the food is free and the drink is free, yes. but everybody goes for the food. Well, that's uh, well, I guess their stomachs overrule their minds, so they must have the, the food and then the booze. When you open that's the door, a, yes. they come in like food is going out of fashion, don't they? <laughs> now, that's true. I think some of them hear about the party and don't eat for three days. But, uh, <laughs> no, but they can, there's a saturation point, I would say. This isn't exactly Weight Watchers, you see. <laughs> They're used to big appetites. The 1,500 staff have served 27,000 meals in a day. What is it you like most about the place? Well, I could say you, but I can't. No, you can't. can't say that. <laughs> I think most of the people are getting our family and uh, the older crowd, you see. And the younger people are going to Acapulco, or Puerto Rico, or Europe. And so basically, without conventions, I think they'd be mostly empty. And without the older people. So basically, this was the Inn Hotel 15 years ago. Now it's become like uh, Coney Island in Miami. Well, look around, you know. I'd like to see that Ann Margaret this evening, though, boy. Well, you should stay, because we're going. 
nobody could be any better than Tom Jones was. Oh, come on. Oh, hey, wow. Do they climb up on the stage and everything? They had the police there waiting the police there, to get the everybody off, off the stage as soon as the girls jumped on. Who's that? Tom Jones? Tom yeah. Jones. Peggy was the first one they grabbed. <laughs> <laughs> At her first night in the club room, the maitre d' can pick up four or five hundred pounds from guests who must cue and tip and tip, even to see Anne Margaret, whose talent is not immediately apparent. At the opening night party, Ben Novak, after eight operations, still hard of hearing, chats up his star, who's brought her husband. If I know why she loves you. Uh, no, it's that little beard. Yeah. yeah but, no, uh, it's that see, little... I started off like you, and then I let it go down. Yeah, but I can't uh, afford why, to do why that. Why not? Oh, because, because it's expensive to trim it. I haven't got that much money. <laughs> okay. Your company here, the, the, the Fountain Blow, it's not quoted, it's not a public company. No, no, I own all the stock. I, own, I have no partners here. It's your phone, I think. Novak, 60 and three times married, came to Florida from New York during the war looking for a job. The Army and Air Force had requisitioned almost all Miami's hotels, but he found one tumble-down heap, borrowed the money, and opened up. Okay. So, uh, uh, most people thought that no civilians would come down here because there was an Air Force training ba base here. Well, uh, lots of civilians came down that winter and had no place to stay. And my little hotel was a bonanza because there were about five hotels that were left and there were, there were legal reasons why the others couldn't be taken. But mine they didn't take because it was so bad. And when people would complain to me about the hotel, I told them I hated it worse than they did. He bought and sold a succession of hotels, each bigger than the last. Now, in one of his Rolls Royces, Novak escapes from the biggest of them all. Now, if you had a little more available cash then, you could have bought more property. You'd be even richer today. Well, no, I made errors. I, uh, I've been very lucky, so I can't complain. When I sold the Atlantis, I wanted to take all my money and, and go into the land business. And that was the real money. And I didn't want to service anymore. I, I, the service building business was too hard a business to keep servicing people. So I wanted to go into the land business. What you mean is you got fed up with people complaining and... Well... Having to be I nice to everybody. I thought the land business here would be the greatest. And the amount of money I could have made in land would be in such extreme figures down here that if I told them to, you'd be shocked. Like what? Oh, I had one parcel that I had bought for half a million. It was worth uh, eight million that I wanted to buy. It was worth eight. Uh, I, I'll show you, I own land out here now. And I bought a piece, uh, a square mile out here for four million dollars. I expect to sell that for 30 million. Now that's, 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 that's a, the difference. And that's no work. And no servicing. And no guests. Hmm? And no guests. And no guests complaining. And there's nothing wrong in a guest complaining, but I've had it. I've had all the glory of being Mr. Novak all over the world. Uh, I'm known quite almost like an actor, as you said and respected. I've had all of that. I'm not, I'm not really a ham like an actor that lives on applause. The little glory that I received was nice. An actor 
And that clause is, is food for, for, for his stomach. That's food for him to live, but not to me. I don't get applause. No matter how many people look at me and say, oh, that's Mr. No, they'll never applaud me, but they'll applaud an actor. Arriving home, an hotelier who does look like an actor in some gangster movie, maybe, who can talk as tough as any George Raft. Oh, I'm fighting all the time. Uh, for more reasons than one, politically, I'm always in a battle with politicians here because they want to do something that'll hurt tourism. Always, uh, they're always biting at the big fella because he's news. He does something that's bad. They want to write it. Not, they don't like to write the good things. But if a little fella does something bad, he's not, so, he's, he's not a lot of news. Now, they, they took a bite at you some time ago when there was this story about the mafia owning well, your hotel. Well, then I sued the paper for $10 million. And the first time in the history of the paper, they apologized on the front page of, of, the, uh, of their Sunday issue, in boxed in red. An well, well, they retracted. They retracted. didn't really apologize. Retracted. Well, that's the same thing. Hmm. They, didn't they say retracted the statement. They didn't say they were sorry. They said, no, they got one or two of their facts wrong. No, well, they said they were wrong in their statements. But you were the only one who protested. None of the other hotel owners did. They said that they were going to start a series of articles showing that the, most of the hotels were owned by mafia or racketeers. And, and they were going to start with exposing the biggest one first, the Fontainebleau. And they came out with a story and they wrote 19 bad things in that paper. The editor just sat there and, and I made him one deal. I said, look, if you can prove one of the 19 accusations, just one, I'll give you an affidavit giving this hotel to whatever charity you want. But if you can't prove one of them, only one, I want you to give me the same exposure to write about your paper. I want to write about your owners and I want to write about your, your chiefs that work in this paper, such as yourself. I want the same exposure. So he said, no, but I'll tell you what I will do. He says, uh, I'll let you write about yourself. I said, well, why don't you ask my mother? She'll write a better story about me than I can. Then, of course, he was picked up by Newsweek and the wire services. Well, I don't know. Listen, I guess somebody once said, listen, if they stop talking about you, good or bad, it's not good. Because I mean, that's, that's Sinatra psychology. A lot of people thought Sinatra owned a part of, of Fontainebleau. Of course, we were very friendly. Well, Frank no, owned no more part of Fontainebleau than you did. Well, a lot of people think because uh, he knows a lot of people that, that, that used to own nightclubs where he worked were all part of the underworld and things like that. They think that made him one or something. See, Miami has always been tarred with the gangster brush ever since Al Capone was here. Well, he, it started right there because Al Capone came here, the world's most famous big gangster, came here and bought a home here. And they made shindig. They didn't want to write about the doctor, the nice doctor that lived on the corner, who, who was a wonderful surgeon and did great work for humanity. All they wanted to talk about is that house over there belonging to Al Capone's house. Can I tell you a story when I went to the Bahamas to appear as a witness for the new government when they were under an inquiry with, from Great Britain? And the Lord was presiding over the case. Well, I, as an American, was asked if I'd come there by this new government and tell the experience I had with them and the old government. So I said I'd come. Well, while I was there, one of the questions shot at me by this lord who was presiding over the case said to me, Mr. Novak, do you have racketeers staying in your hotel? So I said, your lordship, we have Prince Philip stayed in our hotel, the king and queen of Nepal, we have all the presidents, we have Cardinal Spellman, Cardinal Cushing. I said, we've had all great bankers uh, at our hotel. And I suppose we got uh, racketeers at our hotel. I don't know who's at the hotel. The following morning, the paper had a headline, Ben Novak admits he has racketeers staying at the hotel. Way down in the bottom of the column, way down, Prince Phillips was there, and this fellow was there. But the headline, 
I admit there were racketeers. And that's yellow journalism. So now, for this Miami mine host, what's left to do? I'd like to play with my show horses, go on a boat, play golf, take care of my family, and let somebody else take care of the guests. <laughs>